go to 1372. Staff, please. Uh, Chairman, members, Senate Bill 1372 prohibits the court from ordering family reunification treatment with certain conditions relating to custody and separation between a parent and child, unless both parents consent. With that, I'm available for questions. Question for staff. Thank you. Senator Bowling, good morning. Good morning, members. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for adding SB 1372 to today's agenda. If passed, this bill would prohibit courts from ordering children into unregulated services known as reunification camps. These unregulated programs are part of a lucrative, unregulated industry designed to make kids recant allegations of parental abuse while yielding operators tens of thousands of dollars for this type of training. Many children who attended such camps said they felt the experience left them traumatized. Some of these kids have been physically picked up and forced into a transport agent's vehicle. Members, quite a few people in the community have reached out to me on this uh, bill. Um, Adam Valenti, uh, who will be testifying on this bill, is here today. Um, I'm going to defer to those folks for questions. I have thankfully never had my children go through something like this, but the absolute horror and terror from what I have experienced from reading the emails, um, it's something that I think that we can hopefully stop in Arizona. So thank you so much for adding this to today's agenda, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Thank you. I have a question for the sponsor. Sorry. Mr. Yes, Ms. Chair, Ortiz. Senator Bullock, thanks for being here. Um, I'm just curious to know if you have any data on how often this is happening in Arizona. Mr. Chair, Ms. Ortiz, um, I don't have uh, explicit data, but I can, I can assure you that I can follow up with you. Okay, that'd be helpful. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you. Let's call up the, the uh, speakers. All right, Mr. Chair, first speaker, Adam Ven Venetese. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Mr. Chair, representatives, um, we ha kind of have an order. Uh, we, we wanted to make sure that um, our, our, our testimonies today were heard in the proper order. I think there's a flow to it. So if, if you don't mind, could we call Victoria first? A absolutely. Thank That's you. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, we have Victoria. <laughs> Good morning. Please state your name for the record. Good morning. My name is Victoria Nielsen. Um, I'll go as fast as I can, but I would like extra time if possible. Um, I'm a survivor of the horrific, atrocious, and traumatizing reunification camp building family bridges. I'm not only a victim of this camp, but also of the Arizona Family Court. My father has abused my brother and I throughout our entire childhood in every manner imaginable, such as medical neglect, withholding food, physical, mental, emotional, and even sexual. My mom tried over the course of our 13-year-long court case to protect us and keep us safe from our father, who we were forced to live with half-time against our will. My mom had full custody for two years, which was awarded to her by DCS as a result of their severe concern of the abuses we reported that we suffered at the hands of our father. The court flipped the entire situation onto her, wrongly accused her of alienation, and refer reverse custody to our, onto our abuser, our father. Our father has a history of domestic violence and has gone to jail for that. He is a very angry and violent person. My mom was forced and threatened with jail, contempt, and fines to bring us to the courthouse on May 27, 2021. Four strangers thoroughly searched us, took our phones, money, and any personal belongings that provided us with any comfort. We were never told where we were going, that we would be forced to live with our father, or even what time it was. We were completely isolated from the outside world and treated like criminals. These strangers threatened us the entire car ride that we would never see our mother again and she would go to jail if we did not cooperate. We were not afforded any privacy. These intimidating strangers even watched us go to the bathroom. My brother and I were in tears the entire van ride and were utterly terrified and held on to each other desperately. We were forced to stay in a hotel room with these transporters. They did not even tell us what state we were in or what was happening at this time. They barricaded us into a hotel room with them when we were forced to sleep in the same room with all four of these strangers. We had been trafficked across state lines in the back of a van to Ventura, California, and no one knew. The next day, we were forced to attend a four-day long camp, each day consisting of eight hours, and we were told we could not have any communication with our mom or her entire family for 90 days, and we were threatened to be sent to a wilderness camp if we did not cooperate. The entire camp consists of brainwashing, reprogramming, and threats. 
After this treacherous camp, my brother and I were forced to live with our abusive father and his emotionally abusive girlfriend. The 90 days is a lie. It is a permanent switch of custody. The only way I could escape was when I turned 18 and I left on the day of my 18th birthday. As a result of this traumatizing and horrendous camp and being with my father for two years, I've developed and suffered from panic attacks, severe anxiety, and eating problems. This has and will continue to be a healing journey for me with my loving mother and her side of the family that was wrongfully held from. All my mom ever did was protect and advocate for my brother and I. My little brother just turned 15, and since I spoke at the Senate committee on February 12th, he has broken his right tibia and severely injured his left ankle, and it has not been fully examined and cared for. My brother, Marcus, is still gone, and he is stuck in my abusive father's care. He is imprisoned, isolated, neglected, and brainwashed with my father. The court banned me from even having contact with him because they know I will protect him from my father's abuses and threats. He can now hardly walk. He is miserable and voiceless. I am begging you to please pass this bill and help prevent other kids from experiencing these horrific camps that have scarred and traumatized me for life. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chair? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Victoria, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. It's incredibly brave of you. I know it's not easy. And I know we had met in my office uh, a few months ago. Um, so thank you for um, being here again. And I just wanted um, to see if you can tell the committee if um, it was an Arizona court. Was it an Arizona court where, where uh, this camp was, was ordered? Um, Chairman, um, Senator, or sorry, Representative Ortiz, yeah, so it was ordered here in Maricopa County. Um, Judge Como ordered it. And then the camp took place in um, Ventura, California. But it was ordered in Arizona, if okay. that answers your question. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Biasucci. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you again for, for sharing your story. No, it's not easy to do. And I don't know if you have the answer to this, or maybe or Senator Bullock does. So these camps are um, mandated by the court, or they're obviously given the order. But who runs this program? Is this a state agency? Is this contracted through a third party? Um, who oversees this? Who regulates it? Does anybody have those answers? Um, chairman, representative. So who runs these camps is Randy Rand. He had his license taken away by Kamala Harris in, I believe it was 2008. So he is illegally practicing. He practices these camps all over the country. I've connected with um, many other survivors from all over the country that um, he has run their camp. And it's basically just therapists. But all these court-appointed court therapists, they tell you you're liars when you report abuse. Um, they never listen to your concerns. My brother and I have reported abuse our entire childhood, but instead of listening to our concerns, the court just flips it onto the good parent. And all of these court appointees are consistent in every case. Many other people here can tell you that. It's all the same people. Um, but there's a few different therapists that run these camps, but the main one I would say is Randy Rand. All right, thank you. And mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, Yes. <clears throat> I don't know if we can have somebody else answer, but I, I'm, I'm just curious who... At what point was this authorized as a treatment option through the Arizona courts? Who makes that decision and who decided to contract with the company? That I would love that answer if, we, if somebody has it. I know she might not have it, but, but I don't know if there's any other questions for her or uh, from anybody else. Thank you for being here. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm David. My name is David Segui. My two sons were sent to the same camp just shortly before they were sent and I've known Angie for years so which is a small coincidence but uh, when you ask who is in charge it's Randy Rand operates this illegal it's unlicensed camp no facility no brick and mortar building in California it hops around started in Northern California now it's in Southern California the kids are then ordered by the family court in Arizona to be transported across state lines by an unlicensed transport team out of Utah Sometimes, willingly, if you don't comply, they will physically restrain you and force you in restraint to be taken. Randy Ram then operates the camp. He is not allowed to operate the camp. His license was suspended and he had, there's parameters put on him. He is not supposed to operate. He jokingly says, I only, I only hand out water and do administrative work. But he ran the four-day camp for my kids. And then after that, ran their four-day camp. He subject, okay. He also says that it's a 90-day, we're told that it's a 90-day temporary switch of custody when they remove our children. That's a lie. That's judicial deception fraud upon the court because Randy Rand, when he lost his 
his license. In 2012, he appealed it. In, in quotes, he states to the, the board in California that Mike Camp is a permanent switch of custody, which the data backs, because nobody gets their kids back, except for I did, before they're 18. You don't get your kids back till they're 18. They have to age out, which is consistent with what he stated to the board, that it's a permanent switch of custody. That's in quotes. I didn't make it up. He said it. So there's no such thing as 90 day. You, that's why you never get your kids back. But he runs it. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes. I'm sorry, what was your name again? David C. David. It, is David signed in at all? No, not yet. Okay, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get you a sheet. So uh, uh, the, the question still becomes, and maybe Senator Bullock needs to answer it, but mm -hmm. when the court gives the, the, the mandate or the requirement for them to attend this, who has decided that? Is this something that the courts have decided that these are vendors who they can – I mean, I find it hard to believe that if he's not – licensed how did they get access to the court giving this uh, maybe she could yeah your confusion is our confusion so how is that the court gives the court gives the authority to these so-called experts a best interest attorney stephanie stromper was brought into my case she has never spoken to my kids 30 days after the just same judge ostrowski ruled that i did not alienate she emergency order the same saying that my boys were to be removed, dropped off at the courthouse steps. They don't know anything. I'm supposed to call my attorney five when I'm five miles away. The kids are supposed to not know anything. Apprehended, taken by the transport team out of Utah and taken to God knows where, because they don't tell us where they're going to be taken. No license by either party. Okay, the best interest attorney has never spoken to my kids, so how does she know what, what they're being subjected to? This lady's... It's the same there. Okay, well, hang on. Okay. We, we, we got to be yeah. in total order here. The Please, one, I'm sorry. one person at a time. Yeah. And I apologize Thank for you. Sure. My condolences for your loss, by the way. I Thank should you. have said it at the beginning. But the same therapists are always blind list picked and put on the cases. The same people that perpetuated the, this scam Excuse are on me. her case. Victoria, her case. if, if you're her done, case. please have a seat. They're always the same therapist, yeah, and they're please. trained at the AFCC. Randy Rand, this comes trickles all the way down from Randy Rand. Randy Rand started this parental alienation nonsense. That let me, I thank you for your time. Let me just read what Randy Rand believes. This is just one of a million quotes, because the camp is set up. It's a last ditch effort for the pedophile to get custody of their kids, and I apologize for not having my readers. This is a quote by Randy Rand out of his, his writings, The True and False Allegations of Child Abuse in 1992. The pedophile has to be helped to appreciate that pedophilia has been considered the norm by the vast majority of individuals in the history of the world. He has to be helped to appreciate that even today, it is a widespread and accepted practice among literally billions of people I, I want to vomit. This is the guy that was standing in, f whose, whose partner, this is Richard Gardner. This is Richard Gardner was. He's the father of parental alienation. He created parental alienation. He was partners with Randy Rand at one point in time. They started these camps. So the people that push these camps, this is what they, this is the person that they, they follow. And I was, I was, Richard Gardner's name came up multitude of times in the years that I was trying to protect my kids that he was an expert. This is the person, you can, you can read, there's more quotes. Google Re Richard Gardner pedophilia quotes. You'll throw up. Is this it? is disgusting. My son, I asked my son, shy, he's an 18, he's 18, he's, he's, he, he's outside of this control. My, my, younger bro, my younger son, Brock, is 15. I asked shy, can you attend? He couldn't attend because of school, school today. I said, what would you want them to hear? He said, anybody that would support these camps must be a pedophile. That was all he could say. And he threw an adjective in there before that, before the pedophile. Thank you. Do you have another question? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, um, yes, uh, thank you for talking. I, I'm not sure if, if Senator Bolton can come up or if there's anybody from the courts. I'm, I still haven't got the answer that I'm looking for, and I don't know who can answer. The, the, the answer I'm trying to figure out is who has authorized these treatment the camp. camps, but the, I mean, well, the, the, is the this judges. a statute? Is this in Arizona law? Have the courts like who authorizes? How is this even happening? That's the problem. There's no. 
Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. There's no oversight in the family court, so they just do whatever they want. There is no excuse me rule of law. I, I am about to clear the room yeah guys so about yeah. 30 I, I, seconds from decorum. clearing so, the room no, so i apologize no you're okay so my sure. question is whether senator bull can answer it or if there's somebody from the courts can senator bull can you potentially come up please I, i'd also be interested in asking a question or two of the senator okay thank you thank you sir thank you well good to see you guys again um they're court ordered so basically there's a list of i guess third party providers and that's how they're getting access to these folks I don't know if anybody's here from the courts. Um, I can tell you right now, um, California yes. banned these. Other states are banning them. So we're not the first one that's thinking about doing it. California, I think Colorado. I think Adam has a list of where the legislation is active. Um, this is, in my, in my opinion, um, it is literally, as the young woman said, she was trafficked to another state um, against her own will. And obviously... The courts, you know, um, they do what they need to do. But this, in my opinion, is out of their domain of what what sort of services that they should be providing. This is not something that we should ever think is a good idea. Mr. Chair. Yes. Sen ahead. Senator Bullock, um, I, I just have some clarifying questions for you. You'll have to forgive me. Family law is in no way my area of expertise, and I know it's been a passion of yours, so forgive my ignorance. Um, the The... Aligned parent that's referenced in the bill. Can you define that for me? I don't have the bill in front of me, so I literally drove down here to be here at eight thirty, and don't have that in front of me. So uh, I, I can I can talk with you offline. Okay, I I think I understand what that means. Here here's here, but we, we should talk offline about that. Then the the second thing though that I'm not sure I understand is on line 15 the use of the term undue coercion is there a definition of that at law because what i'm worried about is like potentially this preventing a court from ordering like conventional therapy conventional family therapy or whatever is there some definition of undue coercion that puts guardrails on that somewhere else in the law or mr chair representative colladin um, i'm willing to work with you to make sure this bill keeps going um, if we want to work on a floor amendment, I'm happy to work with you. I'm happy to reach out to your office to identify whatever those issues might be. So if there are sort of guardrails that you are concerned with, I'm happy to work with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so, I will you. probably have a few other people that will probably join me in, in your office too. So <laughs> thank you, Senator. Yes. Uh, uh, sorry, Senator Bullock. So, no, Senator. Sorry. Mr. We're going to keep doing this back and forth, I guess. Thank you. So um, as I'm reading the bill, I'm understanding that this is not – outlawing these unification camps it is just simply saying that both parents have to consent correct to it. is that correct is there a reason why you did not go to the outlawing of it altogether uh, mr chair uh, representative willoughby that was sort of a consensus in order to try to get this bill passed okay thank you very much yep mr chair one, one more question question uh, senator okay thank you mr chair senator um so you talked about a list of third-party providers um and this horrific case and this this provider that's being accused of horrific things is on that list. I'm curious if you try to um, go to the courts and ask them why they are allowing that uh, entity to be an approved provider, um, because it seems to me like this is something that the courts uh, should be dealing with. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Ortiz, I did not go directly to the court to find out what the list is. I don't believe they would even be able to furnish it to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do you want to climb back up? Mr. Chair, we, um, we've got several people signed in, and we only allow three, four, and three against, so I'm going to put Actually, two and two. Oh, okay. Actually, two and two today. Two. We started so, with Adam. I don't know if we want to end with Adam. Yeah, just, just bring Adam back in. Adam, right? Yes. Thank yes, you, Chairman. Sir. And sorry for the confusion. Um, we had three speakers that really wanted to speak, and then we had a whole others if you would allow. So that was part of the confusion. Um, and I can answer any questions, too. Um, I would love to. Um, so Chairman and Re Representatives, my name is Adam Venitas, and with a heavy heart, um, it, I'm, it's with a heavy heart that I'm even needing to speak today to you. Um, over 12 months ago, my children uh, were ordered into one of these camps, <clears throat> and, haven't, and I haven't seen them since. It's been 12 months. Reunification camps are a devious way for an abusive parent to gain full custody. These camps start with a grueling 90-day no-contact period 
which breaks the child's spirit. Ch children are isolated with their abuser without any contact from a, from a safe parent, from a safe family member, or anyone they trust. <clears throat> the no contact period keeps getting extended 90 days, 90 days, and another 90 days until they're 18 years old. Three states have already passed similar bills. California and Colorado had Democratic, Democratic sponsors. Utah had a Republican sponsor. Protecting Arizona's children should have bipartisan support. Arizona can be the first state in the US to ban reunification camps before the death of a child. Sadly, the three other states waited far too long. So please help us in voting yes in Senate Bill 1372. Thank you. Question for the sir? speaker. Yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir, for being here. And uh, um, I can't imagine the, what you're going through, so I appreciate the, the time. Um, do you know who's responsible for paying for the camps? That's a great question, uh, Chairman and Representative. Um, so the way this works is um, the safe parent is ordered to take the kids to the um, courthouse or they're uh, forcefully removed. What ends up happening is to get the camp going, um, the court orders a 90-day no contact and that the kids need to go to this camp. There's multiple uh, providers, by the way. It's not just Randy Rand. It's, uh, there's turning points for families and other reunification programs. There's even a local program here in Scottsdale. Um, so what they do is they issue for the abusive parent to pay for everything, but then they, they use the wording subject to reallocation, which is code word for the safe parent foots the bill for everything. So right now I have a bill of 45000 that I've paid to have my kids abused. So they turn it to the safe parent and we foot everything. So they sell our houses against our will. They do whatever they take. They go into our bank accounts. They do anything they can. It's a money-making scheme. These, these camps start at about 25000 and they go up to 100000 And so, and unfortunately, some of the parents, uh, you know, most of the parents have the means to do it. When my court case started, they asked for an AFI, an Affidavit of Financial Information. That was the first document that I submitted. My judge knew where I lived and what neighborhood I was in and that it was a good neighborhood. She already had her sights set on selling my house to get my kids away from me. Sir, one more question. Thank you, Chair. Sir, do you know, is there an age range that the children have to be in to go to these camps? Or is it any age? So, uh, Chairman and Representative, um, they'll take, I think, any kids of any age up until 18, because at 18, they age out, right? They become an adult. So they no longer can legally keep the children. So Victoria that testified, she left on her 18th birthday at 12 o'clock. <laughs> like, you can't get any quicker than that, right? So, but they'll take any kids of any age. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, Marshall. Mr. Chair, uh, sir, you said something a minute ago about deaths. Do you have any data on the, uh, the amount of deaths that have occurred in these camps across the nation? Uh, Chairman and Representative, I don't personally have the data. Um, the three states that have passed this law before each have named their bills after the child that has died after the result of one of these camps. They were sent back with their uh, abusive parent, and they ended up. So it has uh, occurred. It, oh, yeah, yeah, multiple times. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair, one more question. Yes. You also, uh, sir, you also stated about, I, I want to know how the courts are obtaining your, your property. How are they obtaining your bank accounts and your property without your permission? <laughs> Chairman and Representative, it's a great question. So we, I didn't think it was possible. My house was held in trust. Um, what they did was they assigned a real estate commissioner. Um, he has done over 500 divorces um, in his own words. And what they did was he went ahead and signed every, every real estate document, my trust, the warranty deed, everything, with my ex, and they essentially transferred ownership to the new owners. I even fought on the sales price. They wouldn't allow it. They wouldn't allow it to even hear me. Um, I have all this documented, and I, I feel like there's a ton of lawsuits that can be had after this, but the problem is we're so financially drained and mentally, emotionally drained that we're just sitting in a spot, we're just getting kicked in the face every time we turn around. So it's really hard for a parent 
to get the energy to fight this system. Thank you. Mr. Biasucci. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> um, can you kind of explain a little bit, uh, and I don't know if you want to get personal or get into details, but can you, can you talk to the, the committee about it? How did this get to this point? Like, what required this re reunification? What required the split? Like, why is this even a thing? And if you can kind of explain what happened to your situation, why you're tra why this even happened from start to, if you can, in a couple minutes. Sure. Uh, Chairman and Representative, um, so my case is very similar to most of the people behind me. Um, so um, a, a parent files for a divorce. Usually there's some sort of abuse happening in these cases where the children are resisting to go with another, the other parent. Okay. Typically, so they call it the non-preferred parent. Um, us parents like to think of it as, as, as the abusive parent, the unsafe parent. So um, the abusive parent or the non-safe parent uses the court system um, systematically to get the children removed and to force the kids back with them. You know, there's child support involved. A lot of times it all has to do with the money. So if a parent knows that they're going to, if the kids go with the other parent, they're going to have to pay child support, so they try to get them. It's like, a, it's like a game if the kids are stuck in the middle. But the kids, in every case, are silenced. They are not being heard. So if you were to interview my 16-year-old or my 14-year-old, if the judge would even listen to them, they would, they would know what the kids feel and why they don't want to be with their abusive parent. So in my case, um, my kids resisted for two years um, and ended up with the judge ordering me to go to the courthouse. I had a no contact order already in place and to bring my children. So I was stuck. I had two orders, bring the kids to the courthouse and don't have, be in contact with them. I was going to be in contempt one way or the other. So I showed up to the courthouse without my children. The judge threw me in jail for eight days for custodial interference. I've never been in trouble my entire life. And so she put me in jail. My children were at my house. They barricaded themselves inside their, the house, and they lasted three days until police officers, lawyers, DCS officers, all of mother's family uh, persuaded them with threats, um, coercive control. I have a ton of it on video. And they were able to remove my two sons, my two youngest kids, um, who were seven and 13 at the time, um, kicking and screaming. And my daughter, who was uh, 16 at the time, stayed in the house and fought everyone off. Later, um, the next day, mother's family broke into my house and assaulted my daughter, trying to forcefully remove her. She fought them off. My kids, my boys were taken to a reunification camp in Texas. My daughter is now fighting for her life, and I'm in jail. Come three days later, my daughter runs away. It's too much for her. She runs away, and she's been a missing child for a year. So I have, a, I have a 16 and a half year old that's been missing for a year. No Christmases, no birthdays, nothing. Mr. Chairman, real quick, sorry. So why did they bring him to the camp and not to the mother? Is the mother, was she the one seeing those abusive parents? Correct. Chairman and Representative, yes. Um, so she was, in this scenario, the abusive parent. No safe, loving parent will, or, will ask the court to issue an order for a reunification camp. If it were me and my children were resisting me, I would say, fine. If I've done something that to make you re resist me, I would rather have your mental, emotional well-being in place. I would never, and all the parents behind us, would never, ever ask the court to order one of these. So, Mr. Chairman, one more question. So the reunif reunification camp is intended to do what? Have the child to go back with you or with the mother who's the abusive parent? Chairman, Representative, um, they are trying to force a relationship with the abusive parent, and they isolate the children to do such that, and they try to rewrite their memories. So any good memory that I had with them, that didn't happen. Any bad memory that happened with mother, that didn't happen either. So I've seen videos of my children. I've seen pictures of them. My son, Zachary, you look in his eyes, and he looks lost. He looks like his soul's gone. It's scary. And he's been in the camp for one year. And he, he will stay there until he turns 18 if we don't pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? OK, so we uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. So thank you. So Mr. Chair, we have two signed in against. If you're here, Sean Emmons and Joan Cloth Zanard. 
Seeing none, no further speakers. All right. Madam Vice Chair, please move the bill. Mr. Chair, I move that Senate Bill 1372 be returned with a due pass recommendation. Secretary. Closing What's that? Closing remarks. Closing remarks. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> we don't do that in the house, so. <laughs> I really wish I could bring everybody's testimony to you. I don't know if they've all emailed it to you. I've had a lot of people reach out to me from around the country and insist that we do the same thing here that they've done in California and other states. Um, I got a message from somebody locally here and he told me that his sister-in-law two years ago jumped off the side of the highway in California and killed herself because the same thing hap happened to her children over yeah. in California. Obviously the court um, reunification camps in California have been banned now. Um, hopefully moving forward we don't see parents and children committing suicide or whatever because of these horrific things. Thank you so much, and I thank hope you, you guys thank all you. vote yes. Thank you, Senator Bullock and the families out there. I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Um, Secretary, please call the roll. Representative Iasucci. Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, this is insane. I, uh, I think the most disturbing part, I didn't even know this existed. I had no idea this was even a thing in our system. And I think more, more troubling is nobody has an answer on who or how the courts use this program. I mean, do they vet these companies? Um, how does this work? If you have companies that are not even licensed? I mean, for me, I would like to see this banned outright. I mean, in my opinion, I mean, hearing what I'm hearing today and look, I'm sure the intent might have been a good one in the beginning of trying to, you know, figure this out when you have abusive situations. But, uh, the fact that we have companies that are taking our children out of state into camps, um, away from their parents. I, it, this is just, it's insane. And I hope, Senator Bullock, you consider, I mean, I'll happily have that amendment on the floor to get rid of these completely. This is just, this is crazy, and um, I vote aye. Representative Hernandez. Mr. Chair, briefly. Please. I am honestly so confused about this committee hearing on this bill. I think there were a lot of alarming statements that now brought up new questions for me. I don't feel comfortable voting yes or no right now until I just look more into it. And, and um, so for right now, I'm just going to vote present. Thank you. Representative Colladin. Mr. Chair, may I? Please. Uh, to respond to the majority leader's statement, uh, there are many ways that the courts facilitate uh, profiting off of um, off of people in, in delicate situations. I mean, that's, that was one of the big impetuses for Senator Kavanaugh and I's uh, probate reform bill, that trustees were pursuant to court order draining people's bank accounts uh, for their own personal aggrandizement. Uh, sometimes in this committee, I, I get the sense that the private prison lobby does the same thing with the bills it tries to run through. Um, so I definitely, it, it actually doesn't shock me as much as it probably should that this kind of stuff is, is supposedly happy. Now, now, it's not something I know a lot about. I'm open to more information before this hits the floor. There are some defini definitional questions I'll, I'll ask of Senator Bullock offline. From my preliminary analysis, I don't think they're going to be a concern, right? But I just want to make sure and, t and, you know, have that reassurance before I hit the floor that I understand exactly what some of those terms mean. Uh, but, but certainly, it seems like a very good bill, and I'm going to vote aye. Representative Marshall. Uh, Mr. Chair. Please. Senator Bullock, thank you for bringing this bill. And for all the families out here, um, sorry for what you guys are going through. These stories are horrendous. Um, I'm right now, I'm really concerned about um, the one that we have in Scottsdale, what's going on there. And I think, I don't, I don't have that power or authority, but I think maybe an inquiry should be um, happening there as well and for your daughter she will be in our prayers and hope you do find her and safe and for that I'm an eye thank you representative Ortiz mr. chair may I yes please thank you um, mr. chair I want to thank everyone who mm -hmm. came to share their stories today and the many people who have also emailed me their stories um, I think I'm walking away from this committee hearing with more questions than answers at this time. Um, I feel as though um, there needs to be some serious investigations into why there are Maricopa County Superior Court judges um, referring families to these um, highly skeptical 
uh, camps that have caused a lot of damage and harm. Um, I would like to have a conversation with the courts directly about that. Um, and I would like to, um, yeah, I think that I really need those answers before I can comfortably vote yes on this because I feel as though we are towing the line of um, taking away judicial discretion in a way that I don't know necessarily gets at the root of the problem we're trying to solve here. Um, so for today, I'm a no, and I look forward to more conversations before this bill hits the floor. Great. Representative Wilby? I. Representative Luna Najera? Mr. Chairman. Please. Um, I want to also thank the families for being here and sharing their difficult stories. Uh, this is this um, bill has definitely brought up a lot more questions than answers. Um, coming in uh, as a substitute today, I am very conflicted. Um, I am going to be um, a no today, but I do reserve the right to uh, change my vote if uh, certain guardrails are put in um, by the time it hits the floor. Thank you. Vice Chair Bliss. Mr. Chair, may I explain my vote, please? Um, I just want to also assure those that didn't get a chance to speak that your voices are still being heard just by your presence here today. Um, you've emailed us. I've gotten several messages. I know the rest of the committee has as well, educating and preparing us on this topic. It certainly was new to me before this month. Um, I think uh, it's going to be very important as we go forward to raise public awareness. Um, I would consider, if you, I were you, working with Senator Bollock, uh, using the power of the office that we have to raise that awareness um, by whatever means that would be. I would also encourage you to look into filing an investigation as soon as possible from, based on just the testimony I've heard. Um, and I look forward to seeing how this bill advances. With that, I vote aye. Chairman Wendt. So I, uh, one of the reasons why I came down here is to, to protect the vulnerable population, which is our children and, and also the elderly population. And um, I had several conversations with Senator Bullock yesterday, and uh, she convinced me to put this bill on the, uh, on the agenda, and I'm glad I did. So um, I'm so sorry about your stories out there. I mean, I'm just, my heart is just breaking right now. And uh, with that, I vote aye. Uh, we have six ayes, two nays. And one uh, present, uh, you have given SB 1372 a due pass recommendation. Thank you all. Thank you, members. And I look forward to hoping to get a majority of um, your side of the aisle uh, to try to actually get to a point where I can get you to a yes. Um, and I look forward to reaching out to Representative Colladin to address his concerns. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, again, for putting this on today's agenda. Thank you. All right, uh, let's go to 60.